And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us all the way from Feral Games, creators of Ghost, creators of Ghost Stops, which is now entering its second edition, or second strike, if you will. The one and only James Gantry. How are you doing today, man? I'm all right, thank you, and thank you for having me on again. Mm -hmm. Thanks for thank you for thank you for coming on. Um, so, I knew th when I had you on previously to d where we c where um when we discussed the Black Iron and and dipped a little bit into um, Ghost Stops. I I you had you had dropped the hint that a second edition of Ghost Stops was in the works at that time. And yeah. ov obviously, if if Chekhov's gun is on the table, it's going to get fired. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I'll start. I'll start on. I'll start on that. Okay. Um. Now, when, now, um. When, walk me through the sit. Walk me through the chain of events when it came to. What what led to the decision to make to make a second edition? Um. Well. Well. Basically, I mean, the game was written. Uh, and released back in 2017, so it's been four years, really, uh, almost since the first edition came out. And and obviously, a lot of things change, and you discover new ways of doing things, and you look at stuff, and you think, well, I could have done that better. Um, so there's an awful lot of that going on, and obviously, because we've got quite a strong community, and I'm in contact with a lot of people talking about it and playing it and so forth. I get a lot of feedback, and there was an awful lot of people saying how they, you know, they home ruled their own bits and pieces. They didn't like that bit, so they changed it to that bit. And it was really good that people were doing that. That people were sort of like changing the rules to fit how they wanted to play. Um, but it got me thinking about how change and how things can improve. Um, and so over the years, that's kind of it hasn't been a great deal of many things. Um, but there's there's a few people who didn't. Didn't want to play a game because it was using fudge dice and stuff. Um, it wasn't fate, uh, which is understandable. People, you know, some people like to have their, you know, the dice they know. Um, this is not a problem. I'm the same way in a lot of ways. And uh, a few other people didn't like playing just as the ICO. They wanted to play as other types of characters, like you know, uh, private military contractors or, or or special forces units and so forth. Mm -hmm. So even though people were doing that anyway. I felt that maybe, like after four years, it was time to update it uh, and make it more uh, um, sort of accessible to a lot more people. Basically, that was a reason. Yeah. Now, given what given what you mentioned about how, about people house ruling um, ghost stops and the mm. amount of feedback that you got, I'm curious if there were any. Um, if there were any repeat patterns in terms of rules that were house ruled out, or um, mecha or mechanics that were that got house rule treatment more frequently than others, um, there was nothing in particular that stood out. I mean, it was just little things, really. I mean, somebody had changed the rules to um, how hand to hand combat worked. Uh, they'd kind of done that, and they'd also posted up a solution in the group so other people could use it as well. And there was a lot of that going on where people were sort of saying, oh, well, I'm doing this, and this is the rule I'm using for it. Mm -hmm. And um, But it wasn't one thing particularly. I mean, I think a lot of people said they, they never played as the ICO. That was the one thing that stood out, among other things. That the re I realized that at that point that maybe I needed to give more options in that area. Uh, but otherwise, no, I mean, there wasn't one particular thing. I mean... Most of it was everybody liked. It was just the odd little thing, like um, as I said, one person took a hand-to-hand -hand combat, or another person added some extra rules for um, biological and radioactive uh, um, dealing with that kind of uh, material in the game. Um, but generally speaking, people people kind of like majority of it. Just it was just the odd things here and there, and a lot of that stuff I kind of added to the expanded rule books that were released. Um, 
over the last well over the last few years uh where we i added more rules and gave more options so you could play sort of like um agents so you could play ex federal agents ex nsa ex dea and that sort of thing um so all of that kind of was incorporated a lot of the things what people said i think somebody mentioned no person mentioned using shields ballistic shields and stuff and there's a whole talk about how they would work so so it's just little things really um but after four years i just felt that maybe it was time to update really now now kind of it now within this uh, within the second edition of Ghost Ops, um, mm. do you do you consider do you consider it more uh, do you consider the focus more on clarification or more on um, more on more on bringing in new changes to the sandbox? I e i e how i e do you consider it to lean a little bit on the realm of a director's cut? No, it's it. it... It's very much a, a second edition in a sense where there's an awful, there is a lot of changes in it. Um, the, the, the good thing about it is is that I've managed to make changes without actually affecting the rules too much. And that may sound a bit strange, but basically what I've managed to do is um, I've, I've adapted the rules, but anything that's available at the moment for Ghost Ops, any mission that you can buy or any source books you can get, Will still be completely compatible with a new version, so you won't have to change any of those. So they'll they'll swap over basically. Now it's basically backwardly backward compatible, right? Um, but there is significant changes. Uh, but these changes don't affect stuff from the past, if you know what I mean. Uh, they just add to it. So um, and also these changes allow me to expand and change and do various different mechanics as well. So. Um, there will be more skills, for example. Uh, other skills will be separated out into into different ways than they were originally. There will be more backgrounds. Uh, there will be not more ways to play. So you'll be able to play as players with ICO still, but you'll also be able to play. There will also be rules for you to play as a private military contractor, as a member of a SWAT team, as a member of a special forces group, as a member of a of a, of, a, of of government agents. Um, so you'll be able to, you know, do SWAT stuff. You'll be able to, as an agent, you'll be able to investigate crime. Crime, like serial crime or killers and stuff like should be an awful lot of investigation aspects to it um as special forces you'll be able to go into uh to deal with things for your own country rather than as with the ico where you are basically a group of people from across the world rather than just one particular aspect of it so where special forces will just work within that country mm -hmm. like the american special forces will just be where american special forces um it, it will basically allow people to play how they want to play rather than dictate sort of how they should play, right, based upon the, the, the game's um, background and, and setting and so forth. Yeah. It opens it up to a lot more, lot more ways. Now, if, um, pl if, if, a tab if a table wanted to, wanted to, play, wanted to play as a... Um... A SWAT team instead instead of instead of as ICO oper operators. Um, how much would change yeah. when it came to character creation? Nothing. Then I mean a SWAT team. I mean you'll still receive a, a background because a SWAT mm -hmm. team tend to be made up of officers, police officers, right? Mm -hmm. So you'll choose your 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 police. Uh, background, so you, whether you were uh, um, sort of a highway patrol or something like that. I mean, there'll be, there'll be a little bending of, of, of laws of reality, but um, you'll be able to choose from what police background you came from. So that would work the same way. I mean, obviously, you wouldn't have a military background, even though you could, probably could have a military background if you really wanted to, because obviously a lot of military end up becoming police officers, uh, or some military kind of end up becoming police officers. But... Um, so there is that aspect to it. But, yeah, I mean, the, the actual character creation work the same way. The only difference would be is that you'll maybe start with different skills. Um, but generally speaking, within your field, you'll still be considered, you know, the, the best of the best. Mm -hmm. um, like in all the fields of if a game, you're, you're always going to be considered, the, you know, the, the team to go to sort of thing. Yeah. And... Now, when it came to um, 
When it came to when it, when it comes to backgrounds, you mentioned on the Kickstarter page about changes in um, ca in in char in character types. Now, when it comes when it comes to the expanded backgrounds, you sh you said that you're aiming for t say that said that you're aiming for about two hundred of them. Um, yeah. Are backgrounds going to work lar largely the same with the setup of um, starting skills, packages, and um, weapons? Um, they will. They will. They will basically start a little bit differently now. So a background will have, um, depending on what sort of system you're using. But I mean, if you go for the standard, but so for your background, you will receive. You will receive some starting skills, but in the new game, there's going to be more start, more skills anyway to choose from. Um, and you'll also receive a number of attribute points. Um, that's something that's going to be added to the new to the new version. Is there are going to be attributes, but whereas in most games attributes add to your skills, mm -hmm. in um, in Ghost Hunter they won't. They'll they'll add to your reaction time, um, your focus, your ability to. Um, how tough you are, how, how much damage you can take, your healing rate, and all that sort of stuff. So they'll they'll still have a they'll still play a part, but it won't add to your skills as such. Um, but yeah, so you'll get a kind of you will get a package with your background based upon what that background is particularly good in, and what they do, and how they train, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, the um, the original ge the original game focused more on. Um, con on contemporary warfare, and one of the things you that you've mentioned with the with this second edition is that you're giving time you're giving time to other um, time periods, whether it be whether yeah. it be um, Second World War or ne or um, near or near future. Tell tell me about some of the plans you have for different time periods and what one could expect as far as how um how a different time period changes what is available aside from ju aside from just um wep aside from just weaponry obviously cuz nobody's going to pull out an mp5 in the second world war no exactly well i mean obviously uh, weapons and equipment will be time specific so you won't be able to receive a lot of the stuff that's available now you won't be able to when the second world war obviously right mm -hmm. and a lot of equipment that was used in the second world war won't be available anymore here in this period so the second world war will you'll be you'll be in a weird way kind of way you'll be limited by what you can play but you'll be also stuck in a situation uh where you're going to have to react so for example in the second world war this is where kind of special forces kind of began really mm -hmm. as a second world war uh with things like the sas obviously began then and from the sas other special forces units sort of came about so you'll be able to play as obviously members of the SAS or the OSE uh, or the OSS, um, and then also members of the resistance um, who will have obviously in intimate details of the country they come from and what country they're, they're playing in. So you'll you'll be kind of like a special force of your own, even though the resistance obviously weren't, but how they acted and how they fought was very similar to a special forces unit mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of infiltration and. Uh, uh, and, and information gathering and so forth. Um, and you could even have an SA, couple of SAS guys working with a couple of resistance guys within a group, right, um, using their knowledge and so forth to, to, to move through the game. So um, obviously, with, so, so with the Second War, you're, you're going to be kind of limited, but you'll still have that kind of similar background because even though the SAS obviously started, like I said, in the Second War, they, they all came from military backgrounds, parachutes, squadrons, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you still have that background, and the background sections will be will be separated out uh, in some way that it'll in this indicate which ones you could choose for what setting. Um, you, so you won't be able to choose. Obviously, you won't be able to choose um, some of the more modern sort of military uh, groups for the Second World War, but you know it will indicate that anyway. So um, so that's that's the plan with the setting. So each one will be specific to. It'll have it'll be as realistic as possible for that setting um, that we can really. Yeah. Now, when it comes to near future, when it, um, the idea the idea of fu of future war of future warfare and a lot of um, a lot of a lot of military settings when it com when it comes to games is a scub topic at at at, at times, and I'm curious and. Yeah. 
when I when I saw that, I mean, I um, I immediately remembered how um, controversial Cyberpunk Third Edition was for how for how far it went with its um attitude about futurism in places. Yeah. But I'm cu I'm curious how f how far fu how um far future you're go you're going with um with the idea of fu of futurism in settings. Okay, so um, the plan is was the plan is to do two, right? So the first one's going to be a kind of a near future, yeah. Um, like you said, which will be based upon the technology that has been kind of developed as we speak, but isn't actually in operation. So at the moment, you hear talk of exoskeletons. You hear talk of uh, well, the military are now working out their next their new um, infantry weaponry. So you're looking at different uh, ammo types made of, made of plastic, mm -hmm. um, plastic cations so they become recyclable and so forth, uh, more electronic-based weaponry, uh, faster sort of pumping out faster rounds at a faster speed. You're looking at intelligent um, weaponry, intelligent bullets, intelligent bombs. Uh, you're talking about um, simple, you know, more advanced drones even, right? Mm -hmm. And even simple kind of robotic mules that will carry gear for, for the military into into war zones, and also things like advanced helicopters, advanced vehicles, and so forth. So all of that stuff is kind of being developed as we speak. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, they're not using it, right? So with near future, all we're doing really is looking at what's been developed and projecting what that would look like in, say, 10, 20 years. Um, the military don't change their weapons very often. So the next round of military weaponry, guns and so forth, assault weapons, will be pretty much the same ones they'll be using for probably the next 10, 20 years anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I think the next one's going to be a 6.25 round or something like that. It's, it's changing everything a little bit. Um, and with the new sort of goggles, the new helmet setups, all of that stuff, it's all going to be very much, uh, it's going to be very interesting really. But So that's, that's how we can project for... Uh, the near future is basically working on what's available now through DARPA and various other industries, military groups, uh, production companies and stuff, and what they're developing now to see what we're going to be using in 10, 20 years. So that's what we mean by near future. So that's quite easy to predict in a way. Um, obviously, we, you know, there's going to be a situation where we're going to get something from, but I don't think we're going to get it wrong as in the sense of with cyberpunk, you know, not having mobile phones and so forth. No. Um, uh, because we can predict it. I mean, things like um, the public sector is a lot harder to predict than the military sector because the military sector tends to sort of illustrate what it's going to be doing. I think one, um, I think one of the, if I recall correctly, one of the one of the twenty rules of combat that they don't teach is your weapon was made by the lowest bidder. <laughs> yeah, 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 and I've been kind of following the bidding process uh, various people have had with the military weaponry six hour and uh, Ekron Kosh and all that sort of stuff so I've been kind of following all of that along over the last few you know last year or so when it all sort of started coming out so yeah so that's that um, with the, there was going to be a far future setting as well which is uh, obviously a bit harder to predict but that's going to be working on a little bit of 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 prediction and what's happening at the moment so that won't be kind of like, you know, Star Wars. It'll be more like the Expanse where you've got Martian colonies, you've got moon colonies, you've got, you know, space stations, and you've got that kind of military element with their more advanced, even more advanced drone, because that's going to be something they're going to probably use more often. And then you're going to have, you know, uh, exoskeletons will still be around, and but they'll be more advanced than they are, you know, when they're released. And so and it'll just be an advancement of what already is, out there yeah. uh, with a few changes, uh, a few extra things thrown in. I don't think you'll be looking at laser guns or uh, but you may be looking at things like rail guns, uh, advanced laser weapons on things like satellites and stuff on space stations, but I don't think there'll be handheld things like that. They'll be still using kind of projectiles and and that kind of thing really, but um, and they may even go into more kind of uh, sub, sort of um, subduing weapons rather than kill weapons. So, um, yeah, so it'll be kind of like a mix between um, the modern sort of warfare and something like the Expanse, where you've got this kind of realistic sort of science fiction, if you like. 
rather um, than something that's completely out there, a bit weird. Yeah, I can I can get that. Um, yeah, because of because of that, do you do you also suppose that the set, that this particular setup will will also it when it comes to that more far future instead instead of now instead of um laser weapons because because you, you already that's already shut that's already shut down. I ha I have seen people experimenting with um with using with using electricity to create essentially essentially uh, coilless rifles. Um, do you suppose do you suppose oh, that's yeah. something that could that could be tooled around within one of those settings? Yeah, probably. Yeah, I mean, if it's if it's something that I mean, it's it's a case of just looking into what's available now and what's coming out, and then trying to project beyond that. Really. I mean, like I said before, we can, we can kind of look at what is going to be coming out in the next 10, 20 years mm -hmm. because it's kind of already in development in a sense, right? right? Um, but it's looking beyond that to 100 years, to 200 years. Now, I mean, they're already talking about Martian colonies. They're already talking about moon colonies and stuff, stuff that is not going to happen today, but it will happen at some point, probably, if we're still around and we haven't wiped ourselves out. But in 100 years' time, we could still be, you know, we could be on, on Mars and on the moon, you know? So... Uh, what it is is a case of looking at what's development at the moment and then seeing how that would advance 50 years from then, really. Um, and it is really a case of looking at how things have advanced over the last, say, 50 years, right? Mm. Like when you, like, we're trying, Cyberpunk's a good example, to be honest. So, Cyberpunk, when that was written back in the 80s, 85, I think it was, um, and they projected that, you know, all this stuff coming up in, in, in 2020, right? They obviously didn't take an account, and they couldn't because it's public sector and nobody really knows. But, I mean, if you think about the telephone, I mean, the only way that could go is, is to be more um, mobile, right? So if you actually think about it, and, and I think with thinking as it is today rather than back in the 80s, people are more they're more able to project what could possibly happen. Because at the moment, things don't seem to be coming out new. They just seem to be coming out either smaller or advanced. Right? Like you look, at, look at the Apple phone, for example. That hasn't really changed over the last 20 years. It's just got smaller and got a bigger camera. And it's just more compact, right? And it's got a few more things for it. And even cars don't really have, haven't really changed. They're still combustion engines. Do you mean? So it's a case of looking at something and thinking, well, how will that project you know, in the future, and how much will it change, and how much will it need to change? You know? Yeah. Um. When it comes when it comes to when it comes to weaponry from the from the past, um. So I, given how I've, given how I made the joke about how a, how a lot of weapons were made to be um, were made by the lowest bidder, and even in the <laughs> even in the Second World War, this is this is applicable. I always end up coming back to um, the Sten gun, <laughs> which um, it, yeah. which will always be the picture example of something that was ma something that was made to be cheap. Um, but I but um, and even I look at the I look at those and and even some of its um pre even its um predecessors and a lot of those weapons were notorious for having issues. Um, yeah. Chief among them the Th the Thompson, which was notorious for being a jam machine. Yeah. Um, I'm cu I'm curious if um, when de when dealing with pa when dealing with um, Second World War we weaponry, if there if there's going if there's going to be some modifications to the sandbox to account for weapon unreliability. Yeah, well, every weapon's, I mean, every weapon's going to have its own kind of profile, obviously. You know, you've got the, the gear lists and stuff, and it will be separated into modern Second World War. And so the, the gear list will reflect uh, the issues that these weapons had. Mm. Uh, rate of fire, like you said, jamming and so forth. Um, and just, you know, how, and, and the... You know, what was available to you know expand upon them, you know, what sites were available and all that. So a lot of things have changed. So all the all weapons lists will reflect that, yeah. No. So weapons will act a lot of things will change from one setting to another. So 
But, you know, it'd be interesting to see how people, I mean, people, some people probably just play World War II or play Vietnam or, or, or just those things completely and nothing else, right? Mm -hmm. But those people who switch from one era to the next, especially going backwards, will we'll probably find a lot of difference in how they, they, they play because obviously they've got to take into account how things were different then. Now, they didn't have certain gear and how the weapons weren't as reliable or um, they may not have been as, they, they, their, uh, their firepower may not have been as, as, you know, as powerful, if you like. Um, and in fact, they didn't have as much protection, like body armors and so forth. Um, a lot of that's going to have to be taken into account, yeah. Mm -hmm. should be interesting, actually. Yeah. And when it... Um... When it comes to now, you've talked now. Um, you also talk about making co making combat faster. Um, what especially with some of the new weapon and armor rules? Now, were there were there instances? What is this a response to aspects that you saw getting saw getting house ruled a bit a bit more? Well, yeah, it was something that I actually. Um, it's something that nobody's really said anything about it. It's just something I kind of didn't like about it. Um, after I'd actually um, created the rules and stuff, and I, uh, you know, I've, I've looked at it, and there was a, there was always something that kind of niggled me, and, and it was kind of something that I changed it anyway in the expanded rules as an alternative um, armor system. But basically, what it does is it takes out a, a step. Really, that's what it does. It um, removes a step from the whole combat situation, which makes it faster. Um, so in theory, that would, you know, that's going to fix that issue that I had with it more than anything. I don't know if anybody else had an issue. Well, I had an issue and it bugged me, so I'm going to change it <laughs> because that's my prerogative. But um, I think it will be something that a lot of people appreciate more. It'll be more um, in line with how, Armors and so forth is treated within normal other role playing games, if you like, like yeah. normal role playing games, other role playing games. Mm -hmm. And I know now when it's now um obviously it's obviously it's still using the Feral Engine, which me which means that it's pr it's st there's still going to be the option for the for the use of fudge dice for those who want for those who want it, but yeah. Um, yeah. What was the impetus for adding a 2d6 or a percentile um, rule set as well? Well, um, well, basically, over the years, people have kind of said, are you going to do it for this system? Are you going to do it for that system? Are you going to do and I get this a lot with all my games, really. People, mm -hmm. people like the concepts, but they often don't like the system, right? And, I mean, everybody kind of does it. I mean, you know, I'll look at a game and think, oh, it's a brute-looking game, and then I'll see the system and don't want to play it because I don't like that particular system, right? And... I think with with fudge dice, I think that's something. It's not that people don't like it as much as that. A lot of people don't aren't aware of what it actually is, or how it actually works. I mean, a lot of people have played Fate, and then people who played Fate will know Fate. But when they pick up like Ghost Ops, it's not Fate, right? So, um, so a lot of people ask me about doing stuff. I think somebody asked me about doing it as a fifth edition game. I had a few of those people ask me that. I had a few people ask me that. Different things, and I thought, well, it'd be nice to have the option of how you want to play the game rather than being stuck with having to do it. I think with Ghost Ops Second Strike, it's all about options, it's all about expanding it so that everybody can play it and everybody can find a reason to play it, right? Mm -hmm. So, I've developed how I've developed the, the, the system now with you know the bits and pieces that uh, I've added to it, like the attributes and so forth. That allows me now to expand it outwards into other systems. So by using exactly the same character creation, um, you'll be able to use it across all the different, the three different systems that's available inside the book. So at the back of the book, you'll have a colored section, which will be kind of a, you'll be able to separate it out. You'll be able to spot it straight away. Mm -hmm. And that will have a complete section on how to play it using 2D6. Uh, and that will be kind of similar to Traveler, where you roll your 2D6, you add your stat, and your skill, and you get over a, a difficulty number. So it's quick, another quick system, and a D100 system, which is you know it's, that's going to be that's going to be something I've developed. Is it going to be different to normal D100 systems? But will equally be as fast because there's certain things about a D100 system I don't like either. So I want to get around that 
Uh, and I've done this by you by making this um, this this D one hundred system um, that I've developed. So you'll be able to make a character how you want, exactly the same way, everything you want, and that character then will be able to use in all three systems. And, and the good thing about that is, is like if you if you build a character right at home and you make your character, you know, you know you think oh, this is an awesome character, right? It's XSAS, whatever. And you go to your mate's house and you play Ghost Ops, and he's using the fudge system, right? You'll be able to play the character with the fudge system. And then the next day, you you know, you, you've got another mate. You go, oh, come over and play Ghost Ops. So you go to his house, but he's using a 2D6 system. But you'll be able to use exactly the same character and just move it into that system without any change to the character. I, all right, I got you. And given, and given, that, given that, is it good? Is... Is it going to be a case where the, where those alternate systems have have their own little sub chapter, or are they or are they going to be sprinkled in th throughout the um throughout the rule throughout the rule set as their own, as um their own boxes or some or something? No, they're going to have their own. There'll be a, a chapter at the back, which will just have rules for two D six, and then another rule, another chapter for rules for D one hundred. So you'll be able to slip straight to those them sections at the back of the book. Mm -hmm. Find the section you want very quickly. And just use those rules. Now, obvious. Now, um, since you since you kind of hinted at it a couple of times, we what we sh I think I think it's high time to dive into it. So, in addition to in addition to those three systems, when it comes to the Feral Engine, you're also you're also of course um, updating um, Savage Ghost Ops to yeah. you to use the um, Suede rules. Um, yeah. And I, I, um, I ended up, a I ended up asking some somebody else who, who, um, has been who has been working on their own Savage World stuff and had and had to deal with um, the 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 sudden introduction of Suede. But what's been what's been your take on the changes from the previous iteration of Savage Worlds up to um to uh, Suede now? Um, I, I don't think. I don't think there's a great deal of difference to me. And I mean, they've, they've cut out a lot of things that kind of, like, you know, charisma and so forth. I think they've kind of streamlined it, really, more than anything else. I like the introduction of of skills, uh, starting skills, which they didn't have originally, obviously. You just bought your skills. But to have a, 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 a number of starting skills at, at D4 is, is quite a good idea. And that, and that, again, helps, actually, for Ghost Ops, because that allows me to not use those particular starting skills, but allow that, that ruling uh, for the backgrounds for, for Savage Worlds. And that's the other thing is that with the, the Savage Ghost of the original, we didn't really have a great deal of backgrounds in it mm -hmm. uh, because it didn't really allow for that. It was very hard to inst it sort of integrate it in because, um, because you had points to spend and so forth and so on. Whereas now, it actually makes it easier to add backgrounds because of that ruling of starting off with I think it is what five starting skills or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so in a way, yeah, it's, it's an improvement um, on for us. Um, and obviously, um, adding settings and stuff. But I don't, I don't, you know, it's. I think we did we did do a suede update for the Savage Ghost Ops, which was a PDF that we threw in with every copy of a of a game that in we bought that was available, uh, and it was only like one or two pages, I think. So. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a there's a great deal of difference, to be honest. Uh, not nothing that's going to be outstanding. I mean, if if you play Savage Worlds and suddenly you start playing Savage Worlds Adventure Edition, you're not going to have to suddenly reread all the rules again. Um, with concept, you know, the basics are still there. You, the wounds still work, the dice rolls and all that sort of stuff. So, um, I think. So if yeah, people, it's going to be. I think if people well, had to read a whole new set of rules, that would have caused a riot at, <laughs> oh, outside of Pinnacle's office. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally. Uh, and this is the other reason why, as like I said, that the ghost like is going to be very compatible with the previous stuff. There's going to be extra stuff, but there's not going to be anything that's going to cause somebody to have to reread all the rules from scratch, mm -hmm. uh, unless of course they want to play it with D six or D one hundred again. Yeah. Now, you now um, unless some unless I'm mistaken, you're you're going f you're going for. You're also get, you're also going to be doing um, fifth edition, and I think it's I think it's really telling that all I have to say is fifth edition, and no and nobody even questions what 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 books fifth edition I'm referring to. 
Although, although yeah. I'll, give, I'll give you props in the sense that you didn't make me cringe by th by by writing the fifth edition of the world's most popular role playing game or or some or some equivalent of that. But yeah, if you, if you like, you can expect it to be said loud. But what? But um, given given the fact that obviously um, five e is a. 5e, much like it, much like all of much like its all of its iterations before that, is a very class-based system. And and um, while while Ghost Stops technically has classes in its core system, it's more I'd say it's more accurate to refer to them as archetypes. Um, yeah. For do, for doing a fit, for doing a fifth edition book, is it ma is it mainly just turning those archetypes into full-on classes? Um, yeah, so so basically, the reason um, I know it's a bit of a weird thing to do, really, because a lot of people have sort of said, "Why, why, we, why have we done that?" Um, and uh, I mean, the reason being is that I get asked for it a lot, and the other reason being is that with the recent release of the Ruin, which was our, our fifth edition kind of uh, post-apocalyptic role-playing game we released recently, mm -hmm. uh, it's been very, very popular. Um, and people seem to really like it. It shows that people kind of want a more something different really, than the usual um, fifth edition stuff. But um, to answer your question, fifth edition is kind of a weird one as well. It's kind of in in, in a weird kind of way, kind of similar to Savage Worlds in a sense where some of the tools are already there, right? So you've already got backgrounds in fifth edition, um, which offer you starting equipment and starting gear and starting skills and all that sort of stuff, right? So you've already got all of that. So that's one step that that's already covered, basically. There must be an awful lot more of them in, in, in Ghost Ops. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, so basically, similar to how in the physical Ghost Ops you had packages, um, you'll kind of have a similar thing within in, in fifth edition. So it'll be slightly different to how Ghost Ops is now, where in, in – so, so let me so let me just go back. So, Ghost Ops First Edition had packages where you could choose to be a sniper, um, an engineer, an assault, or uh, a scout, or whatever, right? So, you had those packages. That's going to be taken out of Ghost Ops. That doesn't exist anymore in Ghost Ops. Now you choose because how special forces work. They they pretty much learn all the skills, right? So you don't have a particular. I mean, somebody may be better at something than others, and they'll be designated that position. But it's not something that you kind of write on your resume. Do you know what I mean? You know, I mean, not in special forces. I mean, obviously you can have snipers and stuff. But mm -hmm. I think that's been taken out, so people can actually have more freedom to choose what they want to specialize in, rather than being told to specialize in something. Right. Whereas in D and D, that will change because they have got classes. So in that, you will have packages still. So your packages will be sniper or engineer or assault or whatever so and they'll cover a kind of standard D, &D packages you know you've got your fighter your assault guy you've got your scout your rogue um you've got your medic your cleric you know what i mean you've got all of these things already in place really it's just a case of just twisting it and renaming it kind of and this is one of the great things that attracted me to doing a Ghost Ops game in the first place was because they are basically a band of adventurers going out there and fighting bad guys, you know. Mm -hmm. And they cover, you know, the, the typical fantasy archetypes. You know, the archer, the cleric, the rogue, the fighter. You've got all of that within a, within a military special office, you know, forces unit within the Ghost Ops game. So. Yeah, now... The now um the the um hardback that you've got that you've got planned that's going to use the um, standard for for the sake of it for the sake of it I'll call the core rules the feral trinity for the for, because <laughs> I am not, because I am not paid by the syllable <laughs> um and that that's going to be about that's going to be you've you say that that's going to be about three hundred about three hundred. 300 pages in in a standard format. Um, yeah. Now, that will depend upon what settings are on, obviously unlocked and so forth. Yeah. Um. And when it comes when it comes to 
when it comes when it comes to the when it came to when it came to the layout, um, mm. I think I I think I hinted at this when I covered um the first edition, but the the um the lay the layout, especially especially with text and the like, had a it was very reminiscent of um of some of some th of some three point X documents that I that I had seen, and is the is the page layout going to be can be largely similar in this new edition? No, I think with with smaller books, with a six by nine book, which is what the original Ghost Ops was in, it allows you to do a kind of single column um, layout a lot easier because obviously your eyes um, have a smaller area to cover, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas in larger books, is the new book's going to be the standard uh, eight and a half by eleven. Um, U.S. letter size, so you know, the same size as your D and D books and all the other books. It's going to be that size, so that's going to be now a new, a, a, a two column layout. Um, so it will be different in that sense. So, uh, so yeah, it will be a different layout. All right, and with it, and with it, and of course, within that, you had I had also noticed um, you had mentioned that you're going to be get you're going to be getting a a um, a bunch of new a bunch of new artwork. Um, yeah. With, so I'm get I'm I'm guessing that the vi that um the a lot of a lot of the visual multi a lot of the visual motif of the of the previous edition won't necessarily won't necessarily be it in, in this um second edition. No, no, it's going to change completely. Mm -hmm. Um, we did a we did a poll actually on um, on the group uh, about what kind of thing they would like to see artwork wise for the second edition and this is going back now a year and a half ago i think i did this mm -hmm. i'm basically asking people what they wanted because um when i did obviously the two fair when i did the first edition with the artwork so i didn't have a great deal of money and i, mean, I still don't have a great deal of money but at the time i didn't have it so you kind of have to go with what you've got really mm -hmm. and what you can afford and um even though the artwork a lot of the artwork for ghost ops i kind of liked there were some elements i didn't like and I don't think a game like Ghost Ops, which is quite, in in a way, it's not as fantastical, obviously, as as um, as D and D or any other game. It's more kind of down to earth, a bit more realistic, and it kind of kind of covers realistic themes. That it kind of needed the artwork that would represent that and show it right. So when I did the poll on the group, I asked them what kind of thing they'd want to have, and basically the majority said they'd rather have uh, a kind of photographs. Uh, and that kind of imagery, rather than have artwork. Um, so that's kind of how we're going. So the artwork on the, the Kickstarter page is kind of going to be pretty much the similar kind of artwork that's going to be throughout the book. So it's going to, so it's going to be lean. It's going to lean more on photos than on um, art pieces. Yeah. Except for things like maps and stuff, so forth. There'll be a lot that will. But generally speaking, yeah, it will lean on, on kind of realistic imagery than artistic um, representations of it. Mainly because uh, it's very hard to find people to do that kind of artwork, to be honest, in a way that actually reflects it in a realistic manner. So yep. now, when now, um, when it came to now, when it comes to some of the. Um, when it comes to some, when it comes to some, some of the, um, when it came to some of the macro goals that you that you had had, when it, especially especially with, um, things like extra missions and, the like, I'm curious what the what what is meant by the act the activity. So the activity, um, there are. There are, there are special forces unit in America. Um, not many people know they exist, though. And this is the, uh, where, it, where it gets kind of interesting with the activity. So the activity was kind of started in the 80s after a failed mission to um, rescue some hostages from an Iranian embassy um, because of the fact that many of the uh, agencies and so forth were not working together very well. And um, at the time, the people who were kind of coordinating it, uh, one of the guys who had worked closely with the SAS um, had decided that they needed something and they needed something to improve really, because otherwise this is going to keep on messing up and stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, long story short, this all boiled down to a group called the activity who were kind of a, uh, um, 
Yeah, super secret. They were kind of a super secret um, special forces unit. I mean, maybe knew they even existed up until 10 or so years ago. Um, and they would deny all knowledge of them existing if anybody ever mentioned it. And I think, I mean, I read a book about the activity and the, the author was even told, people were told not to talk to him about it um, because it is still top secret. And they do all the missions that a lot of people don't know about. Uh, they're like, they're like dark, dark black ops, you know, they're like the blackest black ops, you know. Um, and I know that when I mentioned that as one of the options that they could play as, a lot of a lot of people, especially in um, the military and the intelligence services that we have in our group and things, um, were kind of very excited about that prospect uh, because they are an interesting element um, of the special forces of the world, really. Um, so, yeah. So that's what the uh, reactivity are. Mm -hmm. And now, with, now, um, given the given the um, s given the setup that you ha that you have, um, like presum presuming that now you get you have it you have it set up at um, at cur currently it's getting I'd say it's a little less than five hundred away from hitting. Um, eight thousand pounds, and yeah, with with about eight with about eight days to go. Um, yeah, <laughs> what are what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Are you thinking or are you thinking um early fall for the um digital version? Um, well, I'm hoping that basically um the, the print of the book takes around two months. Uh, because again, it printed. Unlike Ghost Ops, it's not going to be a print on demand. Um, it's actually going to go to a printer and um, be be very nicely printed properly, uh, stitched and all sorts. So, and that takes around two months um, to have that done. So, um, with the release of the hardback being around October, I'm hoping, you know, based upon whether obviously pandemics end and all this other stuff goes stops happening. Um, with a release window in October, then two months before that, which would be August, September time, we'd be releasing the PDF. Because once the PDF's done and it's sent off to the printers, there's no stopping us from releasing it to the backers because obviously it's the same same uh, document, basically, except with a, a cover back on it. So. Yeah. And so. I, I will end up. In the interest of full disclosure, I will I will note that I I I slapped I um slapped down twenty pounds on the, on the thing. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I and I'll cer I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how the, how this de how it develops in the, in this regard. But with all, yeah. with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come to come back up to the temple and enjoy the insanity at play here <laughs> no it's always good i always uh, i'm always happy to come on and talk and as i often say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged <laughs> and of course yeah. ace go ahead Would you believe English is my first language? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>